everybody. Good evening. Welcome to our eighth episode of Beer and Bastards, the best, uh, the uh, the best political and economic show on um, cable. I think this is cable, isn't it? Um, it would be cable if Maddie didn't have a shoddy connection every single time to remind everybody that we're actually just a webcast. Um, we're here with uh, Carl Gibson, the uh, admin and creator of US Uncut. One of them. His adversary, one of them. His adversary, um, the child prodigy, Matt Palumbo, who's actually 21 years old and allowed to drink beer. I just want to <laughs> alert the authorities it's okay that he's having a beer. Um, uh, the two have sparred over some issues, and Carl was nice enough to come on, so kudos to Carl for that. Pleasure to be here. Also, we're here with Mike. Thank you, Carl. Also, Michael Lee, who debunks uh, uh, plenty of uh, inaccuracy, so to, so to speak, from Being Liberal, on his page, Being Liberal Logic. I also want to give a shout out to We Are Capitalists, who contribute a lot to the show as well, and uh, will be on in later episodes. Um, and I am Will Riccadella. I am the admin of the Analytical Conservative. And if you're an adherent of Murray Rothbard, you've probably heard a lot about my page this week. Um, also, uh, I'm an admin at Unbiased America, which actually gives it a little bit of uh, credibility. Um, oh, by the way, and I, I wanted to start I wanted off to today. say, Will, thank you very much for uh, saying U.S. Uncut was the worst Facebook page um, out there. That was that was you guys, right? Yes. Unbiased America. Yeah, I, yes. I remember seeing that in uh, in my feed. It, it made me smile. Work. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. I mean, <laughs> I mean, there is one page that is, if there is one page that's worse than U.S. Uncut, it is Unbiased America. Until I joined. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I wanted to start off. I want to ask you for a few questions, Carl. Did you start the page? And and if so, when and why? Uh, I, yeah, I did start it. It was back in um, February of 2011, and I remember I was living in uh, Jackson, Mississippi at the time, and I was working four okay. part-time jobs. I was a bouncer at a gay club. I was a waiter at this uh, little shitty cafe. I was um, um, a substitute teacher at high schools, and uh, I was also a um, – oh, what else did I do? Oh, yeah, I was a nude model for art classes at a nearby college. And even doing all wow. right, even doing all four of those jobs, I still couldn't make enough to to pay my four fifty in rent every month. I mean, it was it was incredible. Now, I remember wow. I remember at the time because I used to be the um, the legislative reporter for Mississippi Public Broadcasting in Jackson. Um, I blew the whistle on my boss when they were doing something bad and they fired me. Uh, hence m my working four part time jobs. But I remember. A lot of the things I covered back then were about uh, the governor would cut the budget periodically throughout the year, even after the legislature had said it and after he had signed it into law. He would cut it periodically. Uh, his state economists would basically um, undershoot the revenue estimate, and so we would always be under revenue estimates, and so we would always have to cut the budget. And the first things that were cut were schools, education, health care, transportation. And I remember looking at the stats, and I said, well, wait a minute. Um, there's a lot of corporate tax loopholes that are open for big multinationals, and if we had closed these corporate tax loopholes, we could take in an estimated $100 billion in revenue a year. It's according to the Government Accountability Office. And so I did the math, breaking that down. Okay. Mississippi would get about $450 million of that, $100 billion every year, which would be more than enough to plug all of these budget cuts. So I'm like, well, there's the answer right there, right? So I started the page. Uh, it grew pretty quick. Um, by February 26th of, of 2011, about two weeks after I'd started the page, uh, we launched our first uh, National Day of Action. Uh, UK Uncut uh, over in London had reached out to me. We did a coordinated day of action. We had 50 U.S. cities on board that day, and plus people all over the U.K. Uh, by tax what, dates, what, what came first? What came first, UK Uncut well, UK or, uncut or U.S. Uncut? First. Yeah, I read about them, and I was inspired oh, to okay. yeah to start the U.S. version. Gotcha. And then, um, ooh, excuse me. And then after our first International Day of Action, we built up toward uh, Tax Day. Um, by Tax Day 2011, we had people in over 100 cities uh, who were protesting. And uh, then that June, um, we found out that Apple was launching a lobbying campaign for a big repatriation tax holiday where they take all of their money that's uh, kept offshore, untaxed, and they tell the government, they say, you let us bring it back and tax it at 5% instead of uh, 35%. And, you know, that we did the math on that. Uh, we found out that you could hire uh, 90,000 public school teachers at, I think, forty forty five thousand dollars $45,000 a year 
with the amount that they would dodge through that repatriation. So we made a, we made a fun little viral video, and we had uh, Apple actions in 10 different cities where we shut down Apple stores, and we played our video on uh, the uh, Apple laptops at the Mac store. Uh, so after that, that was a lot of fun. We got Apple to disband the lobbying campaign. We won that one. Occupy started in September, and so uncut organizers in all of the cities became Occupy organizers, and uh, the rest is history. Okay, now I have two follow-up questions, and then I'm going to get I'm going to start moving on. One, are you just a citizen activist, or, or did you are you credentialed in any way? Did you go to college for economics or, or political science? I went to. That's a good question. Or is it just? I went to college for uh, journalism. And I was originally I was originally okay. a jazz studies major, and then I realized I didn't want to play drums for uh, ten hours a day, so I decided to uh, I switched to Spanish, and then I switched to journalism. And I worked at I worked at my uh, uh, college NPR station, and from there I went on to Mississippi Public Broadcasting. I covered the oil spill uh, when BP um, exploded the Deepwater Horizon rig. Um, I watched oil hit the beach in Mississippi. Cool. Um, I watched I witnessed an execution. Uh, I covered tornado damage. Uh, I saw a lot of shit in Mississippi. And, yeah, so now I'm a professional journalist. I'm writing for different sites, Salon, Think Progress, Washington Post, Occupy.com. Um, yeah, and so I'm just okay. I'm just kind of uh, – and I think U.S. Uncut is kind of an extension of, of, of that work in a way, uh, just making people aware of things that they may not be aware of before. From an economic, environmental, okay. and now, racial also, justice standpoint. Okay, and people are I, I got you now, and people are also interested in where you are, kind of on the ideological spectrum. I don't, I myself don't necessarily like labels. Me neither. To give people a better idea of where, where uh, to give me a better idea of where you stand, would you, uh, what would you consider yourself? And you can give you can give somebody who you I don't know so much as look up to or somebody with a similar ideology in order to pin mm -hmm. it down more. Do you know what I mean? Um, you know, if you're like a Krugmanite or something. <laughs> right, something definitely more. not a, a Krugmanite, but I would say. I kind of taken a little bit from why I, I don't. He's a little too establishment for me. Why? I mean, he's 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 kind of tied at the hip okay. with the establishment. He's a little out of touch with what people on the street are feeling. But I would say if I had to, well, I agree with you there. Yeah, <laughs> if I had to box myself into an ideological label, um, I would probably say I'm an eco socialist, if that makes sense. Um, so an eco socialist. Yeah. So Jill Stein. So are you saying that environment environment over people? And is that I mean colloquially saying environment over people? The environment is more important than, say, uh, wealth creation, that, that that needs to be considered first? I would say the environment is more important than wealth accumulation. Um, I would also say that you know, if I was to okay. basically give you guys a model uh, candidate who kind of espouses some eco-socialist values, I'd say Jill Stein, uh, who ran in 2012 on the Green Party ticket. She is um, – Jill Stein? Yeah, yeah. So I'd encourage your listeners to look her up, particularly – on you know foreign policy, on military spending, uh, so not just the environment, not just the economy, but from a foreign policy standpoint as well. I think she kind of spouses a lot of views that I agree with. Okay, and let me ask another, just another follow up. Eco socialism, socialism using the term contemporarily, which has changed, uh, you know, from how it used to be interpreted, which was government owns the means of production. Would you consider yourself in favor of government owning the means of production? Or are you in favor of government allowing private ownership but redistributing wealth, deciding where wealth goes, how, how resources are allocated? Would you describe yourself as favoring the former or the latter? To a point, I would say I favor wealth redistribution where if someone accumulates more, than, more wealth than they can reasonably spend in their lifetime, their child's lifetime, their grandchild's lifetime, um, I think, as Huey Long would say, that that person has had his share. Okay. Gotcha. Now we've we've nailed you down. <laughs> now I want to get into <laughs> I want to get into some some topics that you and Matt Palumbo have you know that you've posted on your page and then Matt produced yep. a, a a rebuttal to. And one of them is wages. You discussed that a little bit. You said you know I was working four jobs. I was unable to pay my rent, and this is kind of what provided the impetus to start your page. So I wanted to start on wages, and I mean from there we can go into a basic income. Sure. But Matt, um, uh, you know, you noticed first Carl's post at U.S. Uncut on Costco and Walmart, the differences between the two, how I think it's Costco is more, uh, quote unquote, perceived to be more favorable than Walmart. Um, uh, of course, if you're not looking at it from the perspective of Walmart employees who are working there, certainly for some sort of reason, um, what do you think, wh what was your contention with Carl's point and where did you think he went wrong specifically on wages in that, inst in that, in that case? 
uh, between Co Costco and Walmart. All right. So I know Carl read my piece about uh, responding to a lot of the memes he uh, put forth. And so basically my argument was that while Costco and Walmart are both discount retailers, they're not necessarily comparable, even though they're in the same sector. So if you look at, let's say, the profit per employee compared to Costco and Walmart and the revenue per employee, it's drastically higher at Costco. And if you look at the kinds of neighborhoods that these stores locate in, Costco is primarily in higher income uh, neighborhoods, while Walmart is in lower income. And Walmart, actually, a large segment of their customer base is people on food stamps. So they're kind of catering already to people on the lower end, while Costco is doing the opposite. So that's my contention. That's why Costco is Okay, just to recap, you're saying that Costco, which is in more affluent areas, is able to pay its employees more rather than Walmart, rather than it, uh, mm -hmm. in the instances of Walmart? Yeah, I yeah. We basically I basically argue that Walmart is kind of like you know the, the right. welfare version does, of Costco. Let me ask you a question, Matty. How does fixed costs work? And Costco obviously yeah. buys things at uh, wholesale. I think wouldn't Walmart have higher fixed costs, um, more middlemen? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not actually hundred percent sure uh, of that that in particular. I know in um I think you, know, you read Corey and I's latest book, and Kevin actually. We had him contribute like like I think like ten or fifteen pages about Costco versus Walmart in our economic myth section, and he goes into it in a lot more depth. Also, so I'm not actually sure what the also I, are, I don't know uh, between. The two. I don't know if you go ahead. I know. Well, I mean, I mean Costco also has the advantage of they're charging people okay. just to shop at the store, while Walmart is not. So. I wanted to ask you a, a follow up on that as well. Doesn't Costco charge for a membership? Oh, he did. What he just said. I can't hear a word he's saying, so I'm just yeah. I'm going blind that? here. Um, yeah. Um. Okay. Now I want to get. I, that's okay. You, you already that? addressed it, Maddie. I'm going to move to Mike right now. Okay, Mike. Do you have an opinion on this right. as well? And you know, and, and and take it to a broader point rather than just co co uh, Costco and Walmart. Um, and move into wages. Uh, go ahead. Well. I've touched I've touched on the Costco Walmart debate a couple times. I think one of the things that uh, fails to get pointed out about Costco, I think Matt brings up a good point about the different demographics and the different kind of neighborhoods that they're in. That's a valid point. But another point is that Costco, they have a lot less employees, which allows them to pay more, and their employees are more productive because they have less to do. When you brought up that they cut out the middleman, Costco doesn't have – the same kind of operation that Walmart has. Well, Walmart buys all this stuff. They have it in their warehouse. They have to unpack it, take it out of boxes, sort it, put it all over these shelves. Costco doesn't do any of that stuff. That's why they have less employees, right. and that's why they're able to pay them more. And, and Costco puts it out on pallets, you know, wholesale, buy, you know, right. 15 boxes of popcorn. Walmart has to separate this stuff. Their operations are completely different, and that's why Costco employs thousands less people and when you employ less people, you can pay the right. people that you do employ higher wages. This is basic math. And I think that gets ignored a lot because, well, they're both retail. Well, yeah, they're both retail, but they're not right. both now, the same exact thing either. You know, I, a more, you know, if you want to compare, if you could compare it to Sam's Club, and we could have a, a, a more maybe detailed look at the two. So but it, you're it's saying not it's not an apples to apples Walmart. is what you're saying. Okay, and then, I mean, and to that point, and, and, and just, I, I'm poor. I'm probably the most poor person here, I'm proud to say. I might, Kevin I might will tell everybody, I'm, I'm sure. Pretty, you might have, might have <laughs> Well, anyway, I know that I have, I have less, a lot less disposable income. I'm not talking about the market that they cater to. Walmart caters to those that have a lot less money than the people that, that, that shop at Costco. I can't even afford... The membership at a Costco, that $35 that I have to pay could probably feed me for two weeks. Uh, moreover, I can't buy in that big of bulk. It'll One, it'll go bad, and two, it's just too much money. I have less disposable income. So whatever I do buy has to be something that I'm going to eat that day. Um, so people choose different things, and market pl uh, placates to a different uh, – Walmart placates to a different market. Um, Carl, I want to give you a chance to hit back on a lot of those points. Um, and provide your perspective. Um, do you think it's fair to 
make the claim that it's an apples to oranges comparison rather than an apples to apples. No, I mean, I see. Um, and, and you can elaborate. Yeah, that. I see the point that um, that Michael was making in that Sam's Club is the membership version of Walmart. Uh, Costco is membership based. So in that they are different. You know, also you can't uh, you, you can buy single units at Walmart. You can't uh, buy in bulk at Walmart. Uh, so, yeah, they're different from in that way as well. Uh, however, they are the same in that um, you know you talk about how they're in different neighborhoods, but a lot of uh, a lot of neighborhoods, including neighborhoods I've lived in before, Cos Costco and Walmart are you know a half mile apart from each other. I think one of the people in the chat session mentioned that as well. Uh, now, maybe you might need more money to shop at Costco if you're going to buy a lot of stuff in bulk. Although actually, if you shop at Costco uh, in a smart way, I found you can actually save a lot of money. Um, Costco carries a lot of things other than groceries. You know, I got a winter coat there for like. 40 bucks. I got a pair of snow boots for 20 bucks. Uh, you know, in any other store, those would be at least twice as much. Uh, now, and I will say, right. I will say that as far as employees are concerned, I think a starting cashier at Costco makes, I think, 17 50 an hour. It might be higher uh, than the last time when I checked it. I think a starting uh, cashier at Walmart makes $9.50, $10 an hour. Now, I would say from, right. from a free market standpoint, I think it would make sense for Walmart to pay their employees at least $15 an hour. Walmart found out when they recently raised their wage uh, from the minimum wage to nine fifty and ten dollars an hour. Uh, they found that a lot of their employees, when they're making these poverty wages, uh, they can't really be as productive as they want them to be uh, because they always have to struggle to make ends meet. So Walmart says, let's pay them a little extra uh, here and there, and then it'll be a good PR move for us because a lot of people have been challenging us to raise our wages, um, but it also make our employees a little more productive. Now I'd say following on that point, uh, it wouldn't cost Walmart uh, anything else if they wanted to raise employee wages to $15 an hour. Uh, now here's why I say that. Right. Uh, a study from uh, I think 2013 came out and said that if Walmart had raised employee wages to $14.90 an hour, they wouldn't have to raise prices by one cent. All they would have to do is stop buying back their stock, which only enriches the options owned by the executives, making the executives richer. Um, right. And a lot of those stock buybacks, uh, they could just be undone to fund a fourteen ninety an hour minimum wage. If Walmart did that, I would applaud them, and I would shop there every day. Okay, so here, now I, there's a couple of points, a couple of follow ups that I want uh, I want to make. One, you said Costco and Walmart. Sometimes they're located right next to each other. Um, I don't know. I don't know if that really confirms anything other than the fact that they both cater to different markets. Walmart. Uh, uh, a, a lesser a affluent map. market, Costco a more affluent market. So in my eyes, Walmart uh, actually does more for the less affluent. If you look at it um, from, from from that standpoint, I again I can't shop at Costco. I can't afford it. I care little for what the what the cashier makes at Costco. I, I don't care what they make. I just care that I can go to Walmart and buy things a lot cheaper and save some of the money that I have. Um, so to that that one point there. Also, um, if Let's say Walmart was forced to pay more. That's fine. Perhaps maybe they should make fifteen dollars and or uh, uh, you know uh, an hour at, at the cashier. But what happens if they hire less? Maybe they just hire more skilled people and then just hire less skilled people. What happens to the less skilled now that they can't accumulate any human capital? They'll be unhirable. They'll only look for people that have experience in the first place. So you'd have that problem there too. What well, with but. With basic supply I, I and demand, some, if I, I can touch on that, points, yeah. Um, go ahead. With basic supply and demand, if you know, if you own a business, and if a lot of people are coming to your business because they enjoy your products and they enjoy your prices, you will have so much demand that eventually you'll need to hire on more people to help out with that increased demand. Likewise, if there is right. little to no demand, and if you have a lot of people, you'll probably have to let some of them go just because there's not enough work for for everyone to do. Now. Whether Walmart hires right. and fires people, I don't think it will be because of, of wages or, or certain regulations. I think Walmart hires as many people, uh, as few people as they can to accommodate for the demand that they have. If there's a higher demand for Walmart's products, Certainly. then they would have to hire level. more people. You know, that, supply and demand. They, they hire as much, right, they hire as much as they can at that price level in order to maximize revenue. But what, what, what I'm saying is if you increase, if you artificially increase the prices, that comes at the expense of people that aren't hired. In my view, that's spreading around the wealth. I don't. I don't think it's. I, I don't think it helps anybody else if we raise it to fifteen dollars an hour, and those people that were making it nine no longer have a job. I mean, in that in that case, you know, a minimum really is zero dollars an hour. That that's the real minimum wage. In my in my opinion, I mean, uh, what do you think, Mike? Uh, Go ahead. I, 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 well, um, can if I, I could just question? jump in right now. Go, uh, Matt. Me or Mike? Go ahead, Matt. You can go. 
I mean, the thing is, I mean, there is a such thing as job gentrification. And what people don't understand is that let's say Walmart raises their wage to 15 an hour. It doesn't mean the cashier that's making nine an hour will go to making 15. It could be a more high skilled cashier will take that nine dollar right. an hour cashier's place. So it could be that high skilled people who would otherwise be earning that wage at Costco will now be working at Walmart instead. It's not necessarily the same people who will be earning those wages because they need the productivity right. to justify it. So that's my argument in response to that. Also, I mean, I think we've all seen that study where it was like, you oh, know, Walmart could pay their employees 15. Yeah, the, just, have to raise, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Keep fuck, going on your point. Keep going. But you guys can hear me now? Yeah, you're back. All right. Sorry about that. So, um, yeah, we've seen that study where it's like, you know, Walmart could pay their employees 15 an hour and they would only have to raise prices, you know, let's say 10 cents per person's visit. Well, if they could raise that much revenue, why not just raise prices right, right, now right. and not no, get exactly. employees? That's so that would be my uh, argument. Uh, Mike, go ahead. I know you're chomping at the bit here. On to Mike. Yeah, sorry, I'm talking no, we so can fast. Hear you right now. Just because Mike, interest follow shit. up. All right, thank God. Well, no, I just I just want to ask uh, Carl a question. You know, we talk about supply and demand. I don't know how you could make the claim that when we're talking about the law of supply and demand, how you could raise the price of something and not expect for there to be less demand for it. If we're going to talk about supply and demand, if you arbitrarily raise wages, which are a price, then there has to be less demand. Wouldn't, I mean, wouldn't you agree I'm not, with that I'm if we're sure, talking I'm not about entirely sure what you're saying. You're saying if, um, if, say, Walmart was to raise their prices, you think there would be less demand for the products? Sure. That's a law of demand. That's a, that's a law. Yeah. Go, go ahead. Well, no, go ahead. I'm, I'm, yeah. Uh, if Walmart raised their prices, yeah. But I'm saying you, we're talking about supply and demand. You said that Walmart should raise their wages. No. Wages are just a price. Just because we call it a different word doesn't mean it's any different. It's actually just a price. So if we raise wages, if we arbitrarily say Walmart raises wages to this amount of money, I don't know how you could argue at that point that there wouldn't be less demand. I mean, I think Walmart. For labor it's like I price. said earlier. Walmart is going to hire as few people as possible and pay them as little as they can uh, to make as much money as they can. Now, if Walmart was to raise their wages to fifteen dollars an hour, so you're saying the the former cashiers that they had would be out of a job if they raised wages? Is, is that what is that what you're saying? I'm saying either those cashiers would be out of a job or as turnover goes, they would hire less people. But some way or another, I mean, there would be I a lower always, demand Yeah, I think there's always going to be a, a high demand for Walmart products, particularly because their business model involves moving into a neighborhood, um, lowering the prices lower than all the other local businesses, shutting out all the local businesses, and having an effective monopoly in a lot of towns. I grew up in Kentucky where uh, their only grocery store, hardware store, electronic store anywhere is, is Walmart. I think there's always going to be a demand for Walmart's uh, prices and their products. I think if, regardless if they raise their prices by 10 cents, if they raise their, their wages, uh, I don't think it would affect their demand. I think they would st still be a, a very profitable company. Um, I don't know if they would have to, if they would be forced to hire less people either, because I mean, people are always going to be shopping there. They're the only game in town. Uh, and to that point, Carl, would you say that? No, not right guys now. Want to, move on to, uh, to Carl, not right now. We'll move. That's okay. There's other people All that right. want to no, hear it. They're just the not as uh, boisterous about it. Um, to to Carl's point right. is um, I, I forgot what I was going to say, but I mean I, what Mike was saying is that pe people are selling their labor. Okay, yeah, that, that's what Mike's basically saying is that there's a demand. Like Walmart will come in. Yes, there's a demand for these products, and then Walmart demands labor. People fill those spots. They're willing to sell their labor. Uh, Walmart's willing to pay them for it. It's the same thing as me going to Walmart. I'm willing to pay them for a stick of deodorant. They're willing to provide it for mm -hmm. me. It's, it, it, there's little difference. No one's coercing anybody into working at Walmart. Uh, so I don't. I really don't see what the problem is. Moreover, we're all have, we have this broad-based assumption that we know why people work at Walmart. Maybe they're just working there part time. Maybe somebody's married. They want to make some extra money on the side. I don't think people work at Walmart looking for a career necessarily. And maybe some people do move up the ladder faster than others. They become managers. I don't. They start working in the corporate industry, which is fine too. But I don't think anybody stays there expecting to buy a Lamborghini um, and working at the and work as a cashier at Walmart. And you're right about that, Will. But I think I think people, just from a philosophical standpoint, I think people are entitled to 
you know, if you're working for one of the largest, most profitable companies in the world, if not the largest, most profitable company, I think you're entitled to an adequate standard of living. A lot of these Walmart workers are. Hold, hold on, hold, hold on. Well, let me to that point. I mean, the only reason why these businesses open is the incentive of profits to maximize their revenue. Let me ask you, Carl, when you get somebody that wants to paint your house or do work on your car, do you shop around asking for the highest price or do you look for the lowest? Well, like anyone else, I would I would look for the lowest price, you know, but I think as a… Right. So that's how the equilibriums reach. And many other people look for the lowest price as well. I don't know. I mean, I'm just trying to say, like, you know, everybody's assuming that they know what the individual wants. That At that price, that maybe that's what fits into that individual schedule. I don't know why they're working there. I just know that they do. They don't Jobs have to work on trees. I, mean, sure I can't just strap on my job helmet and climb in the job cannon and, and shoot off to, to job land where jobs grow on jobbies. You know, I think right. a lot of people are just forced into you know a, a, an unfortunate situation. They have to work for a company that will do a lot of things like work them 29 and a half hours a week so they never get paid full-time hours. They never get full-time benefits. Carl, what's the alternative? Not work? What's better, not working? How about just not having a job? Well, I mean, there's there's a lot of people who are unemployed. I think they would like to work, uh, and I think we should strive for full employment. Sure, but – and that's another there's question that will be coming up around. is why aren't they working? I mean for every job opening, right, there are four people them. searching for, for jobs, so not everyone can have a job. I mean the government right. needs to step in and have some public sector jobs so we can have full employment. Right. Okay. And to that point, I want to move along. We're talking – I assume you like. Oh, uh, don't spoil Mark season three for me. I'm only like five, five episodes in. Oh, oh yeah. You've, so you, at that point, you've seen you've seen the uh, <laughs> the, the America Works program. It sounds like it'll work when government uh, when government spending doesn't work. Just spend more money. Well, he's also um, he's also cutting Social Security and, and Medicare, which you know I wouldn't I wouldn't right. I wouldn't advise as a good thing to do. But you know that's a whole other conversation. I wouldn't let. I don't want to let people keep more of their money. God forbid. <laughs> Nor do I want. I, I, I want young people to actually subsidize the, uh, the the wealthiest age group in the country. I, I actually want that. I think that's a good thing. Maddie, we're get back to basic. We're going to get to basic income. We're going to go into a broader a broader theme yes, here. And one of the things that we wanted to bring up was basic income. Matt, mm -hmm. um, do you think that who would provide a basic income? Yeah. What is I, I don't I don't have really a definition yet on a living wage, and I'll get back to Carl on this. I don't know what a living wage is. I do not know what poverty wages are, um, and I don't know what a what a basic income would be. If the market's not dictating through equilibrium what these things are, um, and driving prices down, I, I don't know. I have no idea what that is. Can can you elaborate? I don't know if you've done any research on it, but can you give me what a basic income should be? Is it fifty thousand? What's the barometer? Is it a hundred thousand? Yeah. So go ahead. Well, there there are two kinds of basic incomes. There's there's a UBI, a universal basic income, where the government just distributes this, I guess, fixed amount of money to every citizen above age twenty one. And then there's a negative income tax where if you your income falls below a certain level, what was the, second uh, one, the government Matt? makes up a portion of the, the difference. One? So I think the no, oh, you're talking okay, you're talking about earned income, income tax, tax credit tax? right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, the Freedomite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, from what I've seen, a negative income tax would be preferable to a basic income if your goal is some sort of floor, mainly because the negative income tax oh, only targets right. people whose income is below a certain difference. level. Rather than just giving Basically, money to everyone, I just want to add quickly. Um, the fundamental difference with the earned income tax wealth. credit or Friedman's negative income tax is he was working towards incentives, not a basic income. It was basically work. If you work, we'll provide an income. We'll give you a ba we'll give you yes. you know a certain level. But that was only if you're working, and that's to provide the incentive in order to do so. And he was pre he was it was predicated on ba uh, uh, skill building. You know, at building these skills while being somewhat productive, and eventually you'd easily get above whatever mm -hmm. that basic income was. But I want to know more about UBI. Tell, tell me more. Go ahead. Yeah, the, uh, the, the EITC right. is based off of Friedman's negative income tax uh, when Nixon signed it. I believe it was Nixon who signed it into law. Um, it, I mean, it's, it's more effective than any other welfare program. It is a very, I believe it is a, very, a relatively low fraud rate. Um, it, it encourages people to work and they get that subsidy. So, I mean, I think it's 
we're, we're never going to be in a world with right. no welfare, so you kind of have to pick the system that has the least distortionary effects. And I think that and to clarify, Friedman be said he would advocate have now, the negative income tax if you got rid of all other welfare payments. It would only work on its own, and I agree with him on that. But I want you to elaborate more on the UBI, yes. Matt. Uh, yes. What, what's the UBI? And it's a fixed amount of income. How do they set that limit? Where does that come from? Yeah, so Charles Murray at the American Enterprise Institute argued like for like a 10 grand a year uh, UBI. Um, I don't know how she, like how great his math is because I've checked it in a paper I did against like what we would save from eliminating all welfare programs. And that wouldn't be very cost effective. Um, from what I've seen, a negative income tax would cost between one okay. third and about half as much as a UBI. So okay. I think that All would right. be That's a better pragmatic. idea. I like that. Yeah. Mike, what do you think? Is there such thing as a as a basic income? If so, who provides it? And where does the wealth come from? I mean, I, I, do you think people are conflating, uh, you know, uh, money, meaning that oh, you know, fifty thousand dollars, you should earn, you should have a hundred thousand, with actual like production, products and services that that they're missing that money is merely an exchange of products and services, that an amount of money does little in, in, in increasing wealth or, or actual products and services. What do you think? Are they confusing the exchange with actual production? Well, I think that uh, <laughs> who, would, who would ever guess that? I, mean, I think that, uh, you know, how my biggest problem with it would be, you know, it's a it's another basic income. It's another price. It's another thing that's supposed to be set by the market. And I don't know how or who could arbitrarily determine what the correct amount would be for a basic income. Now, I do think that uh, I've seen some research that would show that it would be a uh, basic income would be preferable to our current welfare state because we could actually provide yeah, X amount of people with X amount of money up front. And that would be cheaper yeah. than how much we spend on our current welfare programs. And I've seen some research on that. I get what they're saying, but it's to me, it's really hard to set that number. The negative income tax, I like the idea because at least it, dis as Matt was saying, it doesn't distort incentives as much. It actually provides you with an incentive to earn more and be more productive. So if I had to, you know, pick and choose between welfare, uh, basic income, negative income tax, I'd put negative income tax at the top. Uh, because I think that has the best market incentives, um, but you know, I don't know if how you would be able to provide a, okay. a certain number for a basic right, income. I, I just don't know how that. Would I want to say a basic income. How would it work, and how does it relate to an in, to an incentive structure? Meaning that if the government guarantees a basic income, why would anybody do anything? Um, what what is there? What's the incentive to do, to do something? And where does this come? Where does the income come from? Does it come from their production? Because uh, clearly some people can't produce at what this arbitrary set limit is, just as the minimum wage affects employment. Uh, you know, if you make the minimum wage $20 an hour, I know many high school aged and, 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 and college entry kids that aren't going to have work at the same rate if you have a basic income and somebody has to pay it. I'm assuming it has to come somewhere from the private sector. Don't you think that would kill jobs and hurt people more than it would help? But, but but first and foremost, where what is the basic income? What is that limit? And then and then go on from there and, and tell me where this comes from. Yeah, for me, uh, a universal basic income. I agree with you guys in that it would be good. Uh, it would be a good replacement for you know things like unemployment compensation, um, you know things like uh, uh, food stamps, uh, basic welfare programs like that. Now the balance has to be it has to be not an insane amount of money that people would say well I'm never going to work again obviously that would be unproductive and it can't be it can't be pennies either I mean it has to be it has to be something substantial where I think the the person who would who decides the, who decides girl I obviously would have to be a, a federal law to be you know enforced but I think the so uh, are you saying that just law just the law itself on the books decides or are you saying – because obviously this is allocating resources, and prices generally do that the best. I, I don't think there's many people that would, could argue with that. I, I'm just saying how how would a law best allocate said resources? I, do you, would you leave it to a bureau perhaps, like a politburo? A bureaucrats would say this is where this should go based on what they need, based on – you know, and, and this is what we should take based on what they earn. So, I mean, I don't know if that sounds similar to something we've seen. So the federal before. income tax is <laughs> a, I mean, the it's, federal I, income tax is a redistribution of wealth. People pay taxes and those taxes get redistributed toward public programs and, you know, that's that's 
that's how a lot of the federal allocation of funds works. I think it would be similar in that, say if you had a financial transaction tax, um, if I buy a pair of shoes, I pay 7 8% sales tax. You know, If I get my oil changed, I pay a sales tax. If I go out to eat, I pay a sales tax. People on uh, in the financial sector who are making trades with stocks and credit default swaps and all the rest, they don't pay any sales tax on those transactions. So if you had a, you know, say a 1% sales tax on financial transactions, some studies have estimated that would bring in up to $150 billion of revenue per year, $1.5 trillion over 10 years. Uh, you combine that with things like closing corporate tax loopholes by raising the estate tax up to 5% pre-Bush levels, uh, several other measures, and you could get enough to guarantee people $1,000 a month, $12,000 a year um, for every citizen over age 18. Um, now, I think with $12,000 a year, that would be enough to – say if someone wants to start a business, say if someone wants to go to school to get a degree, uh, that 12000 would provide meager, meager expenses for them to get by, um, have, a, have the most modest means of living um, while they're looking to fulfill their American dream. Okay. Um, I, I think – I'm not exactly sh- – go, go, go ahead, Matt. I just want to ask right, one so, follow-up, and then I'm going to get to you. Um, the, go ahead. All right. Yeah. In regards to the uh, the financial transaction tax, the CBO estimates that a tax of I believe it's let's see, point one percent would bring in 180 billion over a 10 year period, so about 18 billion a year. But they're not taking into account uh, right. the effect it would have on the volume of trading. So in Norway, I don't know it was Norway. It was in Sweden. They had a financial transaction tax. I believe it was about half a percent rather than point one percent or one percent, like Carl said. But it reduced the volume of trading over 90%. Most people just started trading in London instead. So people in London were getting that capital gains, or I believe at least people in London would get that capital gains tax, while people in Sweden were missing out on it then. And they didn't collect way as mu- anywhere near as much as I thought they would because the volume of cha- uh, Let me stop uh, you there, man. transactions I'm, changed so drastically. I want to so ask you, I ask you a follow-up on that. Uh, Carl said, I think, it was, I, don't, I think he revised the numbers, or he just used an example from another country. But... Carl said here in the United States it would be 1.5 trillion over 10 years, right? If we increase the sales taxes on certain things. No, if we had a 1% um, financial are you saying, transaction tax. Uh, uh, like a VAT tax. Uh, any financial. Or tra- national sales tax. Yeah, financial transactions like stocks, uh, derivatives, you know, okay. bonds. Matt, and, and were you saying that? Are you are you saying that the, the raise in prices would decrease demand? Is that what you're saying? And it would, and they're not taking into account the amount of tra- the, the the lower transactions thereof. Matt, can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yes, that's what I was saying. Is it, I mean, it's it's like the whole Laffer curve effect. It's you know, it doesn't take into account incentives. So people hey, are going to respond to the task if you take that into this, account. Matt, and then I'm going to get to Mike. Do you think that 1.5 trillion? Do you think that's better spent by the government, or do you think it's better invested by people? I I I don't know. I mean, we we look at this government as an entity that actually produces something. It's just it's handing it out. What do you think? Do you think people individually can better spend that money? How does that help anybody by the government taking and doling it out? We saw we had the TARP uh, bailout. I don't know who that helped, other than the the auto workers union. Um, then we had the, uh, the, the that second bailout there in 2009. What was that? Nearly 900 billion dollars. I still don't know who that helped. Um, do you think people are better can better spend that money? And you're saying that they're reacting to these incentives. People see this this massive amount of money that's taken from the economy and spent. Uh, you're saying that they're going to react in a way where they're going to spend less. They're not go- or they're going to invest less. Doesn't that? Yeah. So I think you remember in a. I think you remember in Capitalism and Freedom, Friedman talked about different ways to spend money. You know, the, the most efficient being you spending money on yourself because you, it's your money. You want to spend it the best way. You're spending it on yourself. The least efficient would be spending other people's money on other people because it's not your money, so you don't care about it. And you're spending it on people that, right. that aren't you, so you don't care how efficiently it's spent. Well, that's the government. It's, they're spending other people's money on other things, okay. so the structure and of incentives Mike, and, and is to that much point, different. And I'm like, okay. battery's kind of low. Point, a second. Do you think thing. politicians have a have have a uh, like an incentive, uh, a self-interest incentive to take this money and dole it out to voting groups to take the money? And say, yeah, let's increase the sales tax. I mean, this is what they do with Social Security. They give you this false sense of security, like you know, we're going to put this into a little account for you. But really, what they're doing is putting it into a general fund and just subsidizing the groups that they that they generally want support from. 
Do you think that they have an, a self-interest in doing so and taking this money and, and continually saying, yeah, we're going to help people, we're going to help these, you know, these uh, disenfranchised and, and, and less affluent classes? But do you think there's something more nefarious going on? What do you think, Mike? Well, I, well, I, I don't think that I think you've hit on a point here that I don't think any of us here, I don't even think Carl will disagree that politicians spend money on things that benefit politicians getting reelected. And when they get money, when they get money from me and you, they might they might talk about, hey, we're going to spend it over here because it's going to benefit everybody. But really, who it's going to benefit is the people that they wanted it to benefit so that those people will keep donating the money. I don't think anybody here uh, would disagree with that. I, I think the incentive for the politician isn't to really help right. anybody. The incentive for the politician I would agree is to continue well, to be said, Michael, um, crony capitalism is a big problem. Um, there needs to be a lot of people based. Uh, accountability for government officials who tend to reward their own uh, campaign donors and you know golf buddies and so on and so forth. You know, look at the military contracts that are going around. But all I'm saying is, you know, theoretically, if you were to say trust a an official who can be voted out with making this program happen, or a private corporation that is entirely unaccountable to you and can do whatever they want, um, I would choose the person I can vote out every time. Right. So, I mean, and to that point, I mean, you were – go ahead, Mike. I don't understand. Wait. How is, how is a uh, private corporation not accountable to you? <laughs> a private corporation has to earn your business. If, I don't like If Monsanto, you don't go there and spend your money there, they don't make Monsanto's any money. But Monsanto's products are in all the food we eat. They I mean, own 90% like, of the food population. I don't like Walmart, but growing up in Kentucky, as I mentioned, they're often the only store in town. They're the only people you can go to. I could deprive Walmart of my $100 and you know spend it somewhere else. But Walmart is not going to miss my $100. So, I mean, to it, it's laughable to say that you alone can make a difference by not giving your $100 to a major multinational, multi-billion yeah. dollar corporation. So the politician, the politician. Hold on, don't, hold on, Mike. Give me a second vote. and then you can go. Go. Wait. The, the, the politician is going to miss Carl's vote, but Walmart won't miss Carl's $100. So which, you're, you're dropping the bucket to Walmart, but you're not are, dropping the bucket to bound. a politician. Politicians are bound by national same borders exact amount and of multinational you corporations are not. Um, now, if you look at the Trans-Pacific Partnership okay. that Obama and a lot of um, uh, people in Congress are trying to fast check, that would make that problem worse. You know, I want I want there to be accountability, both in the public sector and in the private sector. There is slightly more accountability in the public sector. We can definitely improve on that. And I think we should. But I think there's almost zero accountability in the private sector. It's a lot easier to organize people to vote out a politician than it is for people to organize a successful boycott of a major multinational corporation. I mean, it, it's just it's just a matter of uh, of scale. Carl, do you think there's more turnover in businesses, the amount of businesses going out of business because people don't, you know, don't consider their products or provide any utility to 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 uh, people in small general? Small businesses, we see businesses small struggling businesses of, in their first one to five years. Small and large, absolutely. Small and large, small and large. Businesses small and large. Now, I mean, Sears is struggling. Well, Sears is struggling takes, right now. Uh, Montgomery Ward right. went out of business. Hold on, let me finish. The, let me finish okay. my question here. Um, we see it all the time. What's the turnover in the in Congress? I mean, I think that one of the biggest turnovers ever was in 2010, and I think it was 85 or 85 and above percent remained. I don't see a lot of turnover. I don't see a lot of accountability at all in the legislature. I don't see any in the executive branch, certainly in the administrative state. I see more turnover in the market. Moreover, and here's to my other question. You keep saying multinationals. Are you, are you conflating, say, corporatism with capitalism? If they're multinational companies and they're providing a service to people across – across uh, 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 country lines, is that a, necessarily a bad thing? What is bad about them providing a service that people demand it? Like you said, you grew up in a small town. Walmart just uh, 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 placated to a demand that already existed there, and they were the only ones that could turn a profit maybe in that area, perhaps. We always look at it like they put mom and pop shops out of business, as if people have some sort of um, obligation to subsidize mom and pop shops by paying more for things. So are you saying what I don't what, when you say multinationals and I hear this a lot in academia I don't know what they're talking about are they saying that they're somehow they're bad or that, uh, that uh, what, why are they bad is it that they're business, hooked onto a government policies when every business starts out every business sees a demand and wants to meet it and there's nothing inherently wrong with that now when it becomes a problem is when there's a high concentration of wealth 
either among a politician or among a business. And I think just like a lot of people are calling for the big banks to be broken up, I think that can be amplified to monopolies, uh, not just in you know the financial sector, but across the private sector and in the public sector. You want to talk about a monopoly, look at the monopoly that uh, Democrats have on the state of Illinois and the way that gerrymandering has, has, has been happening. You talk about low turnover in Congress. I would like to see a lot of those gerrymandering uh, rules be undone. I would like to see a lot of these big I companies agree. like no, I, Monsanto be broken I, up. I would like to see you know large companies like Walmart be broken up. I think once a corporation or a politician becomes too big, it's the duty uh, of the people to break them up. Right. I don't know. I don't know much about Monsanto. People keep telling me it's a corporatist entity. But go ahead, Matt. Go. Well, I can jump in. Starbucks has a larger market capitalization than Walmart. And in regards to uh, breaking up monopolies, in most cases, with the exception of natural monopolies, like I think Carl and I were talking about this before the show, like in you know, a water or cable, generally it's a huge barrier to entry that's causing um, this monopoly status. And it's often caused by government. Um, Kevin actually had a great post about um, how banks are getting larger and larger market share over the year. And he pointed out that it costs something like $14 million to charter one new bank. So I think since something like 2008, there's only been one new bank chartered. Uh, I think you could argue that if there was more local banks, if it was cheaper to do so, they could definitely erode mm -hmm. uh, away in market share of you know, the big banks, like Bank of America and PNC and such. Um, I think that, in some cases, would be a way of doing it. Obviously, it won't work all the, all the time. It obviously wouldn't work for you know, Comcast or Verizon. But I think for finance, okay. it could possibly work. Um... I want to. I, I mean, I. I know we want to. I want to get into yeah. student debt now. I want to start. I want to move along. And I know Carl brought the, brought this up. And Carl, I want you to talk about student debt. And I want you to address a question that you would have for Matt. I want. I want to know if you have any questions for Matt about student debt. Um, I think that would be interesting. And I want to hear what Matt's response would be. And I just want to sit back and drink a, a coffee that's laced with <laughs> Bailey's. Yeah, and just listen. And, yeah, exactly. And just listen. <laughs> Carl, go, go ahead. Sure. Um, so, Matt, what do you think about – say if we scrapped the entire uh, Pell Grant system, all of the uh, government-based scholarships that we give out. We scrapped all that. We started over from scratch, and we said, okay, look, it takes $68 billion to provide free four-year public uh, university to everyone. We're just going to do that instead. Free college for everyone at the, at, uh, at the four-year degree level. What do you think about that? Matt, did you hear the question? The um the sixty eight billion figure, it's um yeah, I heard it. The sixty eight billion figure, it's in addition to what we spend currently, which is about I think about three to four hundred billion in subsidies from the federal and the state level. So it's not just the sixty, it's the sixty on top of that. Um I'm trying to follow up for a second. Um let's say. The problem I mainly have with uh, subsidizing universal college education is that already something like 50% of students are going into fields that don't require a degree. So obviously we're losing resources. It's four years where these people are not being productive, where they're studying something that's not going to help them do something marketable. Um, I think it would be more beneficial to encourage people to go to trade schools. And you know, when we look at countries like Sweden, they have a much larger STEM shortage than we have. And additionally, uh, this is actually quite surprising when I looked into it, but their student debt is only something like eight to ten thousand dollars lower than ours on average. So it actually seems that the you know the budget breaker uh, for most families is not student tuition; it's actually room and board. So I think that's a problem. And um, okay. yeah, actually, that's all um, I have to say. Carl, so. do you have a rebuttal? Yeah, um, I just want to you know I want to point out that as far as student loans uh, are concerned, now a lot of people go to college with student loans. Now, I, I would agree with you, Matt, in that it makes more sense if people want uh, a high-paying job, the best, the best option is to find a trade that, um, that you can get hired at a, at a, at a firm that will uh, take on your skill set immediately after like two years of training, like you know, coding or computer science uh, database. You know, a lot of those people come out after like two years of trade school and make eighty ninety thousand dollars $90,000 a year. Uh, but I think education shouldn't be seen just as a way for people to get a job. I think yeah. it's also a thing where – you know, this is America, and America, we want to pride ourselves on having a well-educated population. People who are well-educated make better decisions. They raise better families. They make smarter choices. And I think education should be seen not just as a commodity that can help people be wealthy and, and help corporations become profitable, but also just as betterment of, of society for everyone to, to have a degree. Now, that being said, 
Uh, a lot of let me, let me yeah now let me st- go ahead Will. let me stop you there Carl don't you think profit don't, right I agree with that I to agree a certain extent that. but don't yeah. you think one here's one question to that why should I provide just to give somebody an education why should they take money from me and subsidize their education if they're just going to be smarter I'm doing it because I want them to provide right I want them to provide I want them to increase our productive capabilities in order to bring to force prices down. That's why I would do it. I don't care if they know how to read or what they know how to do. I'm, that's not why. I've already subsidized them for 12 years of their first education. But when they get into school, I think, why don't we look at it as a skill set? Go ahead, Mike. I will. I just well, I, I agree with a, you on know, the whole thing. You know, I actually. Mike. I'm sorry. Was that Mike? You speak, Mike. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I just want to, because, uh, you know, I actually agree a lot with what Carl had to say. Um, you know, education isn't about just, you know, getting a job and becoming the most profitable in your lifetime. But if our goal is to educate people and, and have them be, uh, you know, an educated populace outside of the incentives to make money, there's nothing restraining people from that right now. I could get almost a complete bachelor's degree from MIT online for free tomorrow, right now, if I wanted to, for free. Almost all of their courses are archived online for free. And I can go and I can take every single course I want to take from MIT, one of the most respected institutions in the entire country. Now, I'm not going to get a piece of paper at the end of this that says I did it. The only thing I'm going to get is my own mind saying that I learned this stuff. But if I'm not trying to make money from this, if I'm only trying to enrich and be a more well-educated person, then I don't need that piece of paper at the end of this journey. So there's there's options for people. If, if we're talking about you just want to enrich society by having them more educated – Access to information, regardless of whether or not it's free, whether or not you know you have to go to university to get it, as long as people have no, access to information, that enriches society in itself. Like, you know, with with college. Give Carl so, um, yeah, you, Matt. and, and, ahead, and that's Carl. a good point, Michael. I mean, I certainly agree with freedom of information. That's why I support groups like uh, WikiLeaks. That's why I think Edward Snowden is a hero. Uh, but I would also say that there's a human development aspect too. Now, when I went to college, I went to a four-year university. Um, 30% of my total education probably came from going to class. Uh, the other 70% came from interacting with people, being on my own, being independent, living in a new society, trying to make sense of everything. And that's something that I don't think you can take away from an online course uh, at home. I think being in a new environment, especially at that age, 18 to 22, um, that can really help a lot of people transition into a real world much more effectively than had they just you know, looked at uh, archive courses online at MIT. Okay, and Matt, you had something to say? Um, in kind of regards to the whole, you know, general enlightenment thing that we all kind of agreed with, like, you know, I, I have friends that are studying, like, nursing as a two-year degree or radiography as a two-year degree at a community college, and they're going to be making 50, 60 a year out of college, but the degrees there still require, you know, to take a basic history, a basic philosophy, a basic politics. So you could build it into, you know, a trade school or a two-year program or something like that. I think it's possible to have both. And I wanted you, I don't know if you touched on the point. I might have missed it, Matt. But isn't, yeah. I mean, generally speaking, for those, for the least yeah. well-off among us, isn't really college already kind of free in, in, a, in a sense, under a certain wage? If you're under a certain wage, financial aid and so on? Well, yeah, so I wrote a piece. It's not published yet, but it's about, uh, you know, the whole free community college debate. So I did the math on you know, what a person would qualify for or what tax credits and subsidies a person would generally qualify for for going to community college. The uh, American Opportunity Tax Credit, pretty much anyone with a household income under 160 grand can claim it every year. It's a $2,800 credit. And they'll say, if you're a college student with no income, your parents can claim it and give the money to you directly. So the average community college tuition is up 2,500 to three grand. So that would offset the first two years. Um, the average effective tuition at a public college is only about three grand a year. It's a public state college. We see often the sticker price of you know ten grand a year, twenty grand a year, etc. But you know that's just like you know how Joseph A. Bank everything's so much money that everything's always seventy grand right. off. It's the same kind of business model. So I think people often get confused with the uh, it's yeah the uh, right the sticker um, price for Mike, effective. and you got you kind of. It's not, you know, it's it's not effectively free. Obviously, there's still student debt out there, but it, it could be discounted right. heavily. Mike, claim you built off available. my point. I was All saying right. to Carl that why don't, should I subsidize somebody to college that just wants to go to learn and not actually produce in the end? You're saying that if they really want to do that, they can do so not at my expense. They could do it for free. 
Um, so basically, you kind of touched on my next question, which I want to ask you is how prices allocate education, which is, is a product. They're, these colleges are providing a product. Um, people go to school, whether they're, uh, you know, they're paying for a product or some people are paying, a lot aren't. Do you see this as perverting the price structure and misallocating resources in a way, misallocating education as a resource? What do you, can you elaborate on that at all? Do you agree with me? If everybody were to be able to go, if everybody were yeah, to, be able to mean, go to free, even, for free? Yeah, so even now, would that be misallocation? If it was a household income of under 160000 and an individual that makes less than 80000 is that right, Matt? Yes, you can get a $2,500 annual credit. And even if you make above right. 80, it's a discounted credit. So and I mean, a lot of people I know under a certain it. wage, people are exposed to Pell Grants and all these federal grants and generally go in for free. I, I see it all the time in my college, uh, lower income people. Do you think that misallocates resources, meaning that, well, I go to college, I'm not using any of my own money, whereas they can maybe go into the private sector um, and work, the, work their way up while getting paid or work their way up. What, do you think it misallocates education as a resource? What do you think, Mike? Oh, I think, I mean, I think a lot of the results just from the student loans, uh, it, it's obvious that education has been a misallocated resource. Look, education, why do why does anybody go to college? I think most people, and Chris or Carl might say that some people go to learn, and that's true. I, I would agree with that as well. But I think most people go to college because they, they consider it an investment in their future. They're investing in their future. Now, if it's free for them or it's at a very reduced cost from what it would be, then they they have a larger incentive to go because the risk of their investment is lower than it would be if the price structure was allowed to work correctly. So if you let everybody go for free, not only are you telling everybody that this is a this is an okay investment for you to make, you're also lowering the quality of you know we haven't even got into uh, degree inflation where if you know 75% of the population has a bachelor's degree. Then how valuable is the bachelor's the bachelor's degree in that original investment you made in the first place? It's not as valuable. We've seen this happen with with a, a high school diploma. It used to be a high school diploma was something that you achieved. Now a high school diploma. I mean, if you don't have a high school diploma, you might as well forget about it. You know, and that's the same kind of thing that you're trying to push when you go when you say everybody should have an undergraduate degree. You're going to have the same situation um, and, play and Carl, out. Can there, Carl, I want to get to Carl here. Can, can, there, can the case be made that let's say that I'm a low income student, I can't pay for college, and I'm denied an opportunity just based on, on you know, what I make. So therefore I have to, I have no choice other than to go into the marketplace. Is, is there a case to be made for uh, government per se? Obviously if I say society, in this case I mean government. Is there a case for government to subsidize these educations? And do you think it would solely be just because somebody wants to get an education or wants to learn? Or do you think they would have some sort of duty to, this, to the government or the people that paid for them, as in getting a job and producing? And, and I mean, because I, I think production, if somebody produces something, it helps somebody else if, if, if someone else is, will, is demanding it. What, what do you think, Carl? Yeah, I think, you know, even if there was free college for everybody, right? I don't think a lot of people would necessarily take that. Some people would say, "Well, you know, I have I have connections in the business world. I'm going to go I'm going to go into the private sector and start work." You know, some people might say, "I'm going to join the military." Um, after I join the military, I might start my own business. You know, so free college wouldn't be for everybody, but for everybody who wanted uh, that education, I think that should be available to them. Now, I think if you look at the the you know Michael talked about degree inflation, you know, you see a lot of that now where you know people are. People are essentially forced to get a bachelor's degree if they want to be competitive for a job, right? If you submit your resume, they're want to, they're going to want to know if you have, you know, at least a four-year degree. Now, if there were, you know, say free four-year college for everybody, would there be a problem with degree inflation? Yes, but I think a lot of people would be more educated to yeah. the fact, you know, they might say, well, okay, maybe I need a graduate degree, or maybe I can use this four-year degree to, you know, start my own business or to go into partnerships with other people. And, you know, I think just having that for your education will open up a lot of opportunities and options for people who, you know, may or, not, may or may not find jobs with an employer, but want to go into business for themselves. You know, I think that's the way the future, particularly for people in our generation who want to start their own businesses, work for themselves. You know, I'm self-employed. I don't make a hell of a lot of money, but, you know, it certainly beats, you know, having a boss. Okay. I like that. Um, and Mike, do you have anything to respond? Do you have a rebuttal? I would just say, you know, 
so that we don't go too far at length, I would say that you don't need any sort of degree to be self-employed. Uh, anybody can be self-employed, and a uh, bachelor's degree has nothing to do. I'm, some of the richest people in the world obtained a semester of college. So I, I don't think that has anything to do with uh, yeah, and entrepreneurship and being self-employed. Yeah, connections in the business world that oh. we might not have. I think, go ahead, um, Right, I'm sorry. Let Matt add something, and then Carl, let you give it, I'll give you a chance. Well, I mean, I think the reason the bachelor's ahead, all right, yeah, so I mean, I think Carl sort of touched on this, but the reason, you know, a bachelor's degree will make you stand out in a resume is because you're good, you're better relative to other people. You know, if everyone has a bachelor's degree, the bachelor's degree ceases to make you stand out. I mean, I think Carl realized this to some extent and then kind of, you know, said the whole self-employment route. But I, 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 there is diminishing returns to, okay. to everyone having a degree. Um, I kind of want to move on to, like, uh, I want to, I, I want, I'm sorry, All go right, ahead, so, Matt. I was, gonna, I was just going to say we I should probably move on to. Different I want to take some so, questions. Yeah. We have a lot of questions, and I also want to. Uh, I want to address just. I want get. I want to get Carl on oh. here to address single payer health care. Why he's in favor of it, and what are the pros and what are the cons? Just as briefly as you can. I know that's kind of a, a long topic, but just uh, as briefly as you can, Carl. Then I'll give the guys time to respond to you. Sure. Um, I see health care um, just like education, just like housing. I see it as a human right. People need people need it to live. Um, if you require something to live, I don't think it should be a commodity that uh, people should be able to make a profit off of. I don't think there's uh, there should be any private health insurance corporations. I think health insurance companies are simply a middleman that seek to make a profit off off of other people's uh, injuries and, and suffering. Now, you know, in an ideal world, we could get rid of private insurance companies. We would have free health care for everybody. Uh, obviously, we're a long way from that in the United States. But I think if you have every other civilized country in the world with this system and we don't and you see the immense amount of profit that people make there's something inherently immoral about that um i would love to know your all's thoughts on that okay matt i want you to uh, mike i want you to mike i want you to think about what you just said yes. up, and, and i know you want to I, I know you want to talk about this but matt i want you to respond directly to to what carl just said as as, as quickly as you can yeah so mine's a pretty brief response just in, yeah, just in response, you know, that it's a human right, therefore there shouldn't be a market for it. I think we could argue that there are things that are much more essential than healthcare, such as, you know, food or water, yet we don't deny that there should be a marketplace. I don't for think these there things. should be a market for water. Uh, actually, you know, if you look I at the Soviet Union, water resources I mean, is a more food, they were socialized. Uh, yep. Okay. All right, so uh, we'll stick with food then. You know, so you could say, well, food's more essential than healthcare. Well, you know, in the Soviet Union, something like three percent of their agriculture was social, was a uh, market-based, and yet it was producing something like a third of the country's food. So you could argue that, like, even though it may seem counterintuitive or unfair, it's more efficient to do it privately, and therefore it'll, it would right. it would work better out. Okay, overall. Uh, Mike, that'd be my what response. What do you think about that? I mean, he Carl believes it to be immoral. It's a human right for that people must provide healthcare. That you must become a doctor. I mean, uh, to Carl's point, do you think that government would say this allocate resources insofar as you must become a doctor, you must become a nurse? Um, if, it, if it's a right, government must provide it. If, if it's a right, some, if someone has a right to health care, someone else has an obligation. Is, is that not true? How, how would that work? And if the market's not providing incentive for people to go into these things, who is? Well, I Yeah, it's, it's 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 certainly weird, you know. It's a right. I think where I differ from Carl is that I believe that you have a right to health care. I do not believe that you have a right to free health care. I think everybody has a right to the access to health care uh, by whatever. Because when you when you get into the, to this debate on well, it should be free or it should be paid for by someone else. Well, who's providing that for you? You know, is there an incentive for me if I have the ability to be in a a doctor to provide you with if, because if I'm not making the money. What's my incentive? What's what's the incentive for some of the best and the brightest people to go into these fields? But I I, I want to backtrack a little bit because I think that anything that you think is a right, if you really do think it's a right, if you think healthcare is a right, if you think food is a right, housing, water, if you think going to hockey games is a right, the best way to assure the highest percentage of people obtain what you believe is a right is to let the private allocation of resources take care of it. Maybe we could agree with each other that uh that certain things are rights and I, I'm sympathetic to a lot of liberal arguments about what you know people should have access to and what we need to provide people with 
I'm sympathetic to a lot of those arguments. My problem is, what's the most efficient way to provide those things? You can say that the government can provide it with you, can provide it to you for free, but has it ever really worked out that way? And have people gotten what we consider a right in an efficient manner? And usually the answer to that question is no, right. unless it's been and, and provided by the private Carl, sector. Go ahead, go, Carl. Let me and just speaking. ask a more pointed question about what Mike said. Um, Without the market providing incentives for people to go into these industries and to provide health care, there's obviously a market for it. We, we know that. People are willing to pay for it. Um, how would government allocate the resources? How would they make – would they force doctors to treat people? How, would they force them to go into the industry? I mean these people take time out. They spend a lot of money. They invest their time into becoming a doctor. The only reason they do so is they want to be compensated for it. What would be your alternative to market mechanisms in order to create this – broad-based health care um, that would be sufficient to help everybody regardless of price structure regardless of allocating resources do you have is there what, what in your in your idea what's the best way to do it yeah now you know Medicare I'm sorry Medicare um, medical school is such a racket now if you know if you know doctors you know I dated a doctor a few years ago who said you know, she was uh, in her mid 30s, but she said she was paying for uh, she's paying student loans for med school and she would be for the next 10 to 15 years. Now, med school is really expensive. So I think you would eliminate that problem. You get a lot more people to go into med school if you found a way to, right. you know, subsidize med school to a point where people could say, you know, say, all right, look, so med school, let's say 80 percent of that is subsidized by the government. You only have to pay 20 percent of the med school cost. I think a lot of people with, you know, high math and science capabilities would say, you know, med school is now an option for me now that I don't have to worry about the right. and to that tremendous point, though, cost Pearl, of med school. A lot of that's government's fault, is it not? That they, I mean, these people, they have to go to med school to, to get a license, right? The license issued by the state. I don't know. I think that uh, <laughs> I want. I don't want to be operated by any doctor okay, that doesn't so, have a medical so one, license. They have, I mean, and I think that most, get rid of most med school, they shouldn't have to go to med school, but the state requires it. They no, should. they should have to go to med school, but it should okay, be so, subsidized. Well, aren't people already subsidized? Go ahead, go ahead, Matt. Um, in regards to well, in regards to you know student loan debt for doctors here, like yes, we do take on more debt here, but doctors here do make substantially more. Like when I first responded to Carl, probably about a year ago, you know, the memes, the opposite of America memes, and one of them was something along the lines of, you know, a doctor in Finland explains why they have the greatest education system, and one of the reasons was uh, we pay our doctors like teachers. So when I looked into it, uh, the average it doctor in Finland only makes the equivalent of about finding right here. Right. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, but um, so I, I was looking into it, and I think the average doctor in Finland only made something like 90 grand a year. So I think you could argue that, you know, sure, it's subsidized, but you're getting a smaller payoff at the end. So right. you could argue yeah. that it balances okay. out in the end. The doctors and here I mean, are yeah. and I, mean I, don't, I just don't know if, you, if there's price controls, which single payer is, I think it would provide less incentive um, for doctors. I, I mean, that's what the prices do. If there's a high price, let's say, for brain surgery, uh, they're making a ton of money. More doctors are going to go into that field, bring the prices down. I think that applies to everything in the healthcare industry. If you set a price limit and the amount of work that goes into it or a price floor, less people are going to do it, then less people get care, um, in my view. Um, I just don't know, Carl, I'm lost on how these things would be allocated, why someone would provide it. Would the government make a law? Would they have to make a law that these certain people must be doctors or you have to – wouldn't they have an obligation to do so if healthcare is a right insofar as, well, you have to be a farmer because people need food? And it's immoral to deny people food. Therefore, we have to allocate, you know, these people are going to be farmers. These people are going to be doctors. These people are going to be uh, uh, work in construction. How would these things be done if it wasn't a price structure? A price structure? Uh, that's what I, I mean. It just is, I, I mean, I'm, I, that's where I'm lost. Can you help me on that? Can you help me there? You, yeah, uh, yes. you were cutting in and out. But um, just so I understand your question, uh, just so I understand your question, you're saying that if there was free health care, you're wondering what the uh, mechanism would be, like if the government would require people to right, go into med so, school? Well, or, my or, my or, point is, is how does the government question? get people to do it? They're going to have to pay them a salary. They're going to have to pay them something. And we're right at some point, they're going to have to be compensated. Um, what happens at the go? What happens? Yeah, at and the I think a lot of, it's not enough for people to get into. I think it. a lot That's of my question. 
I think a lot of doctors go into the profession not just because it's a high paying profession, but because a lot of people feel the calling to no. you know to be healers. And they know that that Most is a natural thing they have. Most definitely some well, do, I agree with you, but to say that they all do, I think, would be incorrect. I think a lot of people do it. They know that they're going to be compensated for the immense amount of time they put into it. It's not an easy thing to do. Um, not everybody can do it, and the reason why people do or put in that hard work, yes, some people want to be healers, but it's within their own self-interest. A lot of people want to get, buy a Tesla and a BMW, and a, they want to live a nice life, or they want to provide well for their family, and that's why they do it, too. Um, I mean, in my, so... That's kind of that's just where I, I'm just lost in the fact that I don't know how government can best allocate those resources. I don't know any resource they've ever allocated better than the market, but to be honest with you. I, don't, I really I, – that I don't know other than perhaps some of the legitimate things it's made to do. Um, what, do you, what do you think, Mike? Can, uh, can you elaborate a little bit on, on that point? How, how do you think they would allocate the resources um, by limiting prices and so on and so forth? I don't think oh. – I don't think they would allocate it at all. I think the the funny thing is, you know, I, I've actually had some firsthand experience over here in uh, in Europe now with the system that they have. And one of the things that really struck me over here the most was that people go to the doctor here for everything. Uh, you know, you have a case of the sniffles, and you got people in the doctor. You know, my wife's got to make an appointment for something for a specialist, and she's got to make this appointment like four months in advance. You know, because everybody's going to the doctor for everything. When everything is free, and if healthcare is free, and it's not free here, it's just paid for in taxes. They still have to pay medical bills. They still have to pay insurance costs, but maybe not as much out of pocket as we do. But when they that when they feel like they don't have to pay for it, when they feel like they've already been forced to pay for it, you've already have a misallocation of resources. People are going to the doctor for things that they would have never went to the doctor for if they had to spend you know, you know 45 bucks of their own money. They would have never went to the doctor for that. So it's kind of hard for me to imagine any sort of efficient allocation of resources. And then when you get into the compensation of medical professionals, well, yeah, we can talk about there's medical professionals that go into it for all the right reasons, you know, ideal reasons because they want to help people, they have a skill that they can help people. I'm sure there's people that are like that. And then there's people that are like that but that still wouldn't do that unless they were getting compensated for their investment and their time and their energy. Right. And then there's people that only do it for the money. And the people that do it because they feel like they can help people, well, those are the people that are already out volunteering in Africa, volunteering on ships in the middle of the ocean. These people are already doing that for free, and that's a very small percentage of the but people But I'm sure a lot it. of them are people who are saying, gee, I wish I could be a doctor, but I just can't afford med school. Any... And I think, you know, when, well, you, yeah, when, yeah, well, you free up, when you free up access to med school and you say, look, if you have the science and math skills to become a doctor, we're going to make it possible for you to that. do that. I think – and if – if it required doctors to be paid slightly less, and maybe not, you know, an exorbitant amount of money, but certainly like, you know, Matt was saying the Finland example, ninety, ninety-five thousand dollars a year, you know, I think you would see maybe a um, an exodus of people who are only doing it for the money, but a mass infusion of people who are doing it because of right. the the social good that they want to do, you know, and now that they have the resources that are provided for them, right. they can they can go ahead and do that. I mean, it's a social experiment. If it was done, well, I mean, we'd have to see how it's well, done in the U.S. And uh, well, I was talking about, uh, I actually devoted like a small section in my first book to uh, physician reduction in the chapter about socialized medicine. And when Canada went socialized, they actually had the uh, number one amount of doctors per capita. And now like, they're, they're far down the list since they went socialized. So you could argue that it's due to other things. So that would be one example of a country actually showing a decline in physicians after going socialized. Um, the other example I gave was Massachusetts. However, that could easily be explained by Dr. Uh, yeah, I have a good point, so. Matt. I have one question for Carl, then I'll give you the last word, then we'll move on to some questions. Um, you said, you know, if people have the math and, and science skills and so on, you know, to become a doctor, we should, you know, we should give them access to med school. One, who determines that? And two, what's wrong with the system now? If they're determined they have the math and science skills, don't schools offer scholarships? Um, I don't. I, wouldn't the school see that as they apply, and then I the mean, school could decide? Geez, I'd like this guy to come to my school, do research here. I mean, what? There's a scarcity of resources. I mean, you guys know that better than anyone. I mean, it's not like we could just give out scholarships to everybody in our current system. Exactly. You know, well, there's only a limited best, amount people have to apply. Not no doubt. Who so who best, be taken. who best uh, allocates those resources? Is it somebody, a bureaucrat, or is it the schools that are accepting these people? That's my question. I know that resources are always scarce. 
But I'm just saying, who's best to allocate them? Is it the school that's willing to determine that, yes, their math and science skills are good enough to come here? I'll offer them a, I'll offer them a scholarship. Even, you know, let's say that they're, 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 they don't have a ton of money. Well, we want you to come here. This is what we'll offer you. I know that happens all the time um, in, other field, uh, in other doctorate fields. Um, you come here, you be a TA, you learn, you get, you know, go ahead, Matt. I should, I should, I should say, I think you can justify subsidies based on intelligence rather than income. Because, you know, there's always a the question, what about smart, low-income people? I mean, I say you could subsidize them, but subsidize them right. because of their intelligence, right. not I, just because they're So my low point is, who determines their difference. intelligence? Is it not the school that was is willing to accept them? That is, I, I, they're the ones actually doing the subsidization one way or another. Uh, right? I mean, they're the ones that are taking the student in. Why can't they determine it? Who determines it if not them? That's just, right? Right, yeah. Okay. You're, you're I wanna, I, Carl, yeah. Carl, you get the last word here. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Sure. I mean, ideally, you know, the, the system would have to be worked out through, you know, uh, a lot of process and, you know, loophole, loopholes and people would, you know, have to find a way to make it uh, implemented. But I see an ideal system of universal health care in the United States as, you know, if you want to be a doctor, you apply to med school um, just based on your, your merits, your achievements, your grades, whatever. If they accept you, then you apply for a scholarship through the public sector. The government, say, uh, Department of, uh, of Health or something like that, supplies a scholarship for you based on the school that accepted you. And, you know, you are, say, 85, 90 percent subsidized. And I think a lot more people would be uh, in med school and, you know, taking those courses. So, I mean, it's 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 all hypothetical. So, I mean, there's no example in the United States currently to point to, but that's just the way okay. I, I would see it Good being points. enacted. Um, I want to get to a question. I don't. I think he was trying to write G, just GDP here, unless I'm mistaken. Um, and I think he's. No, it, go ahead. And GDP is. It's one. Uh, it's one of the Fed oh, no, targets okay, a nominal so, GDP so target. So they want to target a nominal GDP, GDP target. Okay. So what, what is your stance on monetary policy? What are your thoughts on, yeah. I just figured, yeah, nominal GDP targeting as proposed by Scott Summer? Um, one, uh, this is a, probably a question for Carl Gibson because I'm interested in what your stance on monetary policy is. Um, so go ahead, Carl. No, I mean, that's that's a broad question. I mean, my, my stance on monetary policy are is you, in... Let me, let me be specific. What, are you what in you... favor of a Fed, a Federal Reserve setting nominal interest rates? Are you in favor of a Federal Reserve manipulating certain um, in the incentive structure in the market? Like, uh, you know, uh, as they say, how they affect real interest rates through nominal interest rates uh, and and so on. I mean, that's what people generally will call printing money. How they manipulate the, the you know, inflation and short run output, the Phillips curve, the ISLM, ISLM curve and so on and so forth. A lot of these Keynesian strategies. Do you think government has a role in that? Ideally, I would like to see I like to see an abolition of the Federal Reserve. It's a creation of the private bankers to you know make our currency their property and to make us all their slaves. I think we should get rid of the Federal Reserve. Um, I would love to see a public bank uh, of sorts. And I would like to see eventually a transition to a resource based economy where instead of meaningless paper currency, uh, we have we have resources. People are incentivized to uh, save resources, to conserve the environment, to instead make the economy based on people's skills, people's contributions through uh, the talents that they themselves can provide. Um, you know, a really utopian idea would be the Venus Project. Uh, that's one example of a resource based economy. But yeah, certainly the Federal Reserve needs to be um, uh, reformed to a great deal, if okay. not completely and on, scrapped out. On the GDP targeting. I mean, we talked about this with we talk about it with minimum wage. They're generally targeting a minimum wage, regardless of what act, what's actually occurring in the real economy. We talked about it with basic income. We're saying that people deserve a basic income. Why not have just a, a nominal GDP that the government sets that says this is what our GDP is going to be, um, regardless of what products and services are actually produced? I think that comes. I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, Mike and and, and Matt. I, is that in not the same vein, uh, setting a target for a uh, nominal GDP? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not right. creating real wealth. It's just printing. I mean, it's just going to lead to inflation if there's not the service. I don't support it. I, I like right. the Friedman rule. It just in, index uh, the money to supply to long run economic growth. What do you think, Mike? Be the best scenario. Yeah, I, I was going to say before Matt said that, I think that, uh, that Friedman put it best. I think that if you index it to economic growth, uh, whether than I mean, Friedman, I think people get confused. Friedman wasn't a fan of. of Federal Reserve Bank, the Federal Reserve Bank either. 
I, I don't think he supported a lot of decisions they made. But yeah, if you, if you can index it to uh, uh, moderate inflation to economic growth, I think that's the most uh, beneficial system. I obviously I don't think I don't think that the Federal Reserve is the best. But at the same time, I don't right. know of an alternative right now. And do you think it should just be pinned to the, 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 to the MVPY strategy, meaning that you know it should be really pinned to what our growth in GDP is over that year? Should be it should, the, the the increase in monetary supply should be pinned to that? I, that would to me that would be okay. the best way to do it. Okay, uh, yeah, at me, least me that I'm aware of now. I should, they think it should stick to that. To that equation. Here's a question for Carl. I want to get to this one. Um, do you think GMOs are bad? Um, JW, since you keep saying how, uh, just wondering. I think that's what that is. I'm not. I'm new to all these these things. Just wondering, since you keep saying how Monsanto is so bad. Almost like. Yeah, I think growing food in a lab um, to be uh, mass engineered and mass produced, I think, can lead to. A lot of complications and you know unnecessary health problems. Now I'm not a scientist, so I mean I'm gonna I'm gonna have to use the Republican argument of I'm not a scientist on this. But based on what I've read about GMOs, uh, there's a great increase of health risks for people who eat GMO-based food and people who don't. Uh, countries that ban GMOs, I know uh, I think 24, 25 countries have banned GMO foods outright. Um, those countries have um, a higher rate of health than uh, countries that eat lots of GMOs, like the United States. So, I mean, just based on what I've read and what I've seen, uh, GMOs are generally not a good thing. I mean, I'm sure there are instances where they can be a good thing. And, I mean, I don't think there's a, a black and white um, uh, way to just buy, have a binary definition for anything. But generally speaking, I think GMOs propose uh, lots of health risks. Matt, do you have an opinion on sense. GMOs? I know you, I, you talk about them all the time. You're like, God, I can't wait to eat my GMO breakfast. I can't wait to eat my GMO lunch. <laughs> um, and also you're just, I mean, honestly, I'm, I'm in the same boat as Carl, you know, I'm not a scientist. So on these sorts of issues, I just generally go with the consensus. Um, I, I believe the consensus is that GMOs are not harmful. Uh, and I, I've, you know, I've heard Neil deGrasse Tyson and uh, what's his head, uh, Bill and I talk about them, but that's really the extent to which I know about it. I haven't seen the evidence that they're harmful. Um, but I've seen, I've seen the evidence that they're very helpful. Wasn't it the guy who created GMO corn? Wasn't he cre credited with savings in like yeah. a billion lives? I can't remember the guy's name. Yeah. Or I mean, they probably had yeah. increased health risks. Yeah, so I think there was a lot. They met. I think like in the in the third world, it's definitely a net positive. You could, uh, absolutely. It's more you're not food considering they their future health. You're just assuming, yeah. well, they're going to eat corn and they're going to live a little longer, but you're not assuming that maybe they're going to get, you know, I don't know, allergies or something later on. Don't you care about their allergies, Mike? I'll just, uh, I, I once again, I really. About... I'll, I'll take yeah. sneezing over dogs. Mike, do you have an That's do you fine. have an opinion on GMOs? <laughs> uh, I'm, well, I kind of I mean a, a little bit of echo what Carl and Matt said is that I'm not a scientist, and so I tend to believe the people that are experts in this matter. I I, I would say that it's weird because I think that you know. If I was taking the same approach as Carl, I've read a lot of people. I've, le I've read a lot of information of people that have had problems, and there's been health risks associated with vaccines. But the scientific consensus is that GMOs are not harmful to the health. And the funny thing is a lot of the countries that have banned GMOs are European countries, and Carl pointed out how they tend to be healthier than the United States. Well, that co that's not a correlation. That's not a causation. That's not GMOs that are the problem in the United States. The problem is some of our habits. A lot of European countries are starting to reconsider their ban on GMOs, and this has started happening in the last couple months, uh, especially the European Union is actually considering letting uh, some of the GMO producing countries start trading freely with the non-GMO producing countries because the scientific consensus has said there's n there's no harm in consuming okay. GMO products. Pretty cool. I know. Um, I don't know if the car. I don't know if the study Carl mentioned really touched the control for this. But obviously, in Europe, they have much lower obesity rates. Um, they tend to tax tobacco a lot more. Like I think I know in uh, I know in Sweden, most people use snus instead of cigarettes or chewing tobacco, which is generally healthier, even though it's not healthy. So there's more regulations of those things. So that could also be a cause. Obviously, I don't know if the study control for that. Okay. Um, and then here's a question for Carl that I don't think the viewers saw at the beginning. We already kind of addressed it. But I don't, you know, they're asking you specifically, Carl, because you're way more, you know, um, influential than I am. That's for sure. 
Here, uh, do you have it? Can you see the question? Carl? Yeah, up right on top. Um, it's at the top. Top of the box. Up on top. I mean, the, the, the chat window just keeps it's refreshing. Like, I'll read it to you. Just I'll read can, it to could you all just read the question for me? Do you have a oh, degree sorry. in economics, sociology, political science, statistics, finance, and ethical philosophy? We already know you have a degree in journalism. Um, if not, why would we believe these claims you make in all these areas, given your resultant your resultant lack of understanding when judging between good and bad policy recommendations? I mean, I that's yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Y'all are free to believe whatever you want. This is a free country. Um, I have a degree in journalism, so my degree allows me to uh, take in lots of information from a lot of different sources, process it, and then uh, spit it back out on a product that is easily digestible for the right. general public. Now, a lot of uh, a lot of the information I consume, you know, comes from economists, comes from political scientists. It's my job to make sense of it and write about it. So, no, I don't have a degree, and I would encourage people to uh, not take everything I say as gospel. Um, I think. I think people are uh, more better informed when they have a wide variety of right. sources to consider. And as a journalist, that's kind of your job. You're disseminating ideas, and you're not doing it under the guise of, well, this is unbiased journalism, or you're not doing it. You're not working for, say, a network or something where you, you know you have to, you know, you're coming from one perspective. You're doing this on your own, just like all of all of us are, uh, in, the, in in the same regards. And you're just getting these ideas mm -hmm. out here as best you know how, which is through those journalistic tendencies. I know I hate journalists. I don't know. I only I think I may perhaps only hate lawyers more. But you seem like a really good guy, Carl. I I appreciate that. I like uh, you, you guys more seem than like good guys as Lumbo. well. Yeah, this is so. actually a lot of fun. Wow. <laughs> I'd like to do this again sometime. Um I'm gonna be traveling over the next few weeks. But um we should definitely get together no, we and do this again. Should. You know? I, I agree, yeah, I and thank you so much for coming on the show. That was really great that you let us three kind of gang up on you at some points. Um, I, I, you know, <laughs> I always, I mean, I always learn from these things. I hope people watching learn things. I hope you guys learn things. Yeah, I hope we exactly. All learn that's things, that's you know? really our ultimate goal here. I know no one learned anything from Michael today, which is pretty standard on all all of our shows. <laughs> pretty, they just know how to drink a foo foo beer out of a wine glass again. And um, I hope when you come back to America, you start drinking Bud Light again, pal, because that's American beer. That or Michelob Ultra Light. <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah. But I get... minus. <laughs> this is American beer right here. But I'm I want to remind you, everybody to follow U.S. Uncut, even though I don't want you to. I'm going to tell you to go follow U.S. Uncut, read their stuff. <laughs> <laughs> also, Being Liberal Logic, a great page run by Michael, and Being Classically Liberal. Also, Matt Palumbo's written a couple of books with some of these ideas that he's disseminated here on the show one is the conscience of a young conservative and the other is in defense with uh, in defense of classical liberalism which you can google and find on amazon they're really inexpensive and they're really well researched and matt pays me to say that on the show and he i wasn't supposed to tell you that also follow being classically liberal and the guys that we are <laughs> capitalists jason david um all those guys over there for all their help and um follow unbiased america and uh, the analytical conservative, um, uh, which has gotten a lot of a lot of action from the uh, the Rothbardian crowd. If there's a Rothbard post on there, if you want to see Tom Woods get destroyed, like all the sycophantic claimers claim that we got destroyed on, uh, uh, on 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 the analytical conservative, you'll love that post. But thanks again for watching, um, Carl. Thanks again. We'll ask you'll come back again. We can talk about this. We, maybe we can get a little bit more heated next time. Start throwing chairs and stuff. He was our yeah. longest broadcast. I'm, I'm yeah, all that. I'll wear yeah. my wrestling outfit. You know, let's. Um, yeah, put your let's wrestling outfit on, Maddie. Don't wear your <laughs> wrestling outfit. No one wants to see that. And um, uh, thank, thanks again. Uh -huh. And uh, we'll see. You, we'll see you guys again soon. Bye. Godspeed.